Just so you know, this show is about scary stuff. So don't say I didn't warn you guys. And remember, don't be scared. Minisode number four. Bust a scream. War Baby here with another episode of Murderous Miners. It's difficult not to admit that violent content has been linked to multiple crimes, committed by young and old alike, but I feel as though a certain type of person is just drawn to a certain type of thing. Perhaps those with a certain personality are just drawn to a specific type of entertainment. It could be due to exposure, like kids growing up around a certain kind of music. Not everyone can love just bunnies and sunshine. Just because someone says they were influenced by something, that doesn't negate the fact that in most circumstances, they knew right from wrong. 1996 saw the release of the first Scream movie in the successful franchise. Directed by legend Wes Craven, the script was written by Kevin Williamson and loosely based on the Gainesville Ripper murders, for which Danny Rowling was executed in 2006. He killed five students over four days in 1990. The movie was a smash hit, as was its sequel Scream 2, released in 1997. By then, cousins 16-year-old Mario Padilla and 14-year-old Samuel Ramirez of Linwood, California, in South L.A., were big fans. Honestly, they were obsessed. The costumes, the voice manipulation, the terror, they loved it. Mario especially related to the killers and how they were able to exert control over their victims. Picking and choosing who would die and why. He lived with his mother and stepfather, Gina and Pedro Castillo, an eight-year-old sister, and an infant sister with whom he shared a bedroom. That must have been weird for him, having pink toys and a carousel piggy bank with tinkly music in such close proximity. But he was a good boy. He loved his mother and his family. They attended church together and had a happy life. And he had his cousin Samuel, who lived down the street, to be his best friend. His dad had recently died from AIDS, and soon Mario was his male role model. After his father died, Samuel was caught on the campus of Linwood High School carrying a pocket knife. With a zero-tolerance weapons policy, the high school immediately expelled Samuel. The boys had been split up, and Mario soon felt isolated with his companion gone from school. To make matters worse, he liked a girl at school who had a boyfriend. He called her and wrote her poems, but she just didn't like him. To be honest, the girls at Linwood High had already determined that Mario was a creep, and he received little in the way of female attention. Mario's obsession with scary movies was picking up steam, and he and Samuel watched Scream over and over. They went to the sequel as well, and before you know it, Mario was harassing his crush with late-night phone calls disguising his voice. He was finally starting to feel something and he began to torment other female classmates with the help of his cousin. They switched targets to the most popular girl in school and pranked her with threatening letters. She was terrified, but had no idea who the culprits were. At the same time, the boys began to fantasize about committing an actual murder, scream style. Masks, cloaks, knives, voice changer... They wanted all the tools to really pull it off right. Around this time, Mario's mother gave birth to his youngest sister. It was around then that he would later admit he began planning to kill her and his stepdad. Friends recalled that not only had Mario talked about the Scream films frequently, but he also complained about his mom grounding him and keeping him from going out. He was actually forbidden from hanging out with his own cousin once he'd been expelled. Mario didn't feel in control of his own life, giving rise to a plot to kill his parents. They would kill them, 
then take that tinkly carousel bank in his room and buy their supplies. It contained $140 of what Gina referred to as the baby's money. Killing his parents would be just the beginning. A spree was to follow, and the girls at Linwood High were unknowingly in danger. They just needed the money, then the costumes, and the real revenge could begin. Revenge for unwittingly damaging Mario Padilla's ego. The new year dawned, and on January 13, 1998, Mario decided that it was their day to bust a scream, one of their terms for committing the copycat murder in the style of the movie. He got up, got ready, and left for school, adhering to his everyday routine. But instead of going to school, he met Samuel, still expelled, at the nearby arcade. Mario told him that it's time, and they see another teen, Aaron, and see if he wants to join in. Aaron would testify later that Mario said he was going to go home and kill his mom because it seemed like the perfect day to do it. He declined. They had knives. Unbothered, the cousins went on alone. The pair surveilled Gina through the window before charging in, faces covered. She was working at a computer desk and Samuel immediately restrained her from behind so that her son could grab her under the chin and stab her in the chest. And stab Gina he does. The new mother recognized her son regardless of the mask and screamed his name as he stabbed her. She kicked him and bit him. Quite the struggle ensued. Four knives were used. Three knives were broken. Samuel had brought one, some had been from Gina's own kitchen. When she had been subdued, Mario left to clean himself up, but returned to his mother's side to stuff a washcloth into her mouth. He couldn't listen to her begging Samuel for help, that she was dying, or to hear her asking, why, son, why? Mario stabbed her a few more times. He removed the washcloth once his mother had quieted. The boys took the Tinkley Carousel Bank and left to finally begin the spree they had been trying to get started on. But Gina wasn't dead. Miraculously, she was able to get the phone and call her husband, then 911, identifying her son Mario as the person who killed her. And when emergency services did arrive, she was still conscious, able to point to a picture of her son in answer to the question, who did this? She survived for a few more hours, never speaking again, before passing away the same day. The cousins discarded all of the evidence they took with them as they headed to the metro train to go shopping. Their first stop was a gas station for snacks, and there, an alert attendant saw that they were acting very strangely. He called police, and Torrance officers responded. They contact Samuel's mother, letting her know they had picked up her son. They assumed he was a runaway. She let them know that those boys were wanted for murder. Her sister was dead. 16-year-old Mario Salvador Padilla and his cousin, 14-year-old Samuel Jeremias Rodriguez, were both charged with the first-degree murder of Gina Castillo, as well as conspiracy to commit the murder of his stepfather, Pedro Castillo. At trial, with two juries, the judge barred any evidence related to the Scream movies and their supposed influence on the boys' actions. The state alleged that Mario concocted the plan because he didn't want to do chores or adhere to rules about going out. Mario Padilla went with a temporary insanity defense, while Samuel insisted that he never stabbed his Aunt Gina, he only restrained her so that Mario could kill her. But in California... That was the same as committing the murder yourself. Ultimately, Samuel Rodriguez was sentenced to 25 years to life for his role in his aunt's savage butchering. His cousin Mario received life in prison without the possibility of parole. All subsequent appeals and requests for a reduction in his sentence have been denied. He remains behind bars for life. Pedro Castillo did not attend any court proceedings. 
His desire was to have no further contact with the boy he'd brought up for a decade. It's almost Halloween, lovelies. Be back soon with another episode. But until then, don't be scared. <laughs>